Hi guys, we've all got beers and feeling better if we get some coal, yeah? Cool, awesome. Okay, so my name's Chrissy Morgan, and today I'm going to be speaking about the good, the bad, and the ugly of coordinated disclosure, not responsible, and I will come back to that later. So first up, who am I? Um, firstly, I'm a protective fire hacker. Um, I take part in bug bounty programs and I do a lot of security research, which is sometimes outside of bug bounty programs. And when I'm not doing that, I'm doing a lot of work in the community, and if I'm not winning awards that I can get drunk out of, I'm helping <laughs> the next generation. And hopefully, uh, have we got any security researchers here or bug bounties at all? Hands? Awesome. Yeah? Cool. Then you might understand how it's important for the next generation of us you know, learn about our mistakes and learn from us and how they can help uh, their own careers get forward. It's not always easy. Um, one load of stuff, done a load of things. If you are interested, you can take a look at my blog or I'm active on Twitter. My DMs are always open. I'm happy to answer any questions. But first off, a disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> so... It does feel like a bit of a bad idea because, so, first off, I'm not a lawyer or a vulnerability, a vulnerability management program expert. Uh, like I said before, I'm a security researcher, and today I want to tell you about the circumstances around the actual vulnerabilities that I've found. And, you know, half the time you can't talk about these things because you're under NDA. So, some of the stuff I'm about to say today, you know, is making it public. First up, a bit of a history lesson. I'd like to tell you about background of where the stuff has started and uh, some 101 stuff for people who aren't into bug bounty programs or know about security research. Now, this is Alfred Charles Hobbs. I would call him a bit of a school hacker. So, Charles liked locks, and what he would do, he would go about and he would pick locks back in the day in the 1800s, and he would set himself to challenges to go around breaking these locks. Now, one of the challenges that was set was for him at Crystal Palace in London, uh, it's actually where I'm from, um, in 1853. At the Great Exhibition, he ended up saying, right, I'm going to break this lock, and it was a Brahms lock. And a Brahms lock at those sort of days were a very good lock. So the challenge was set, and he was given 30 days to break this lock. And uh, Alfred here, he managed to do it in 24 days which is pretty good. Now, he was good at what he did. Now, as you can imagine, the vendor who gave him the lock, they didn't take very kindly to the fact that he found massive holes there. Uh, to the fact they were like, no, the lock was broken, there wasn't any issues, you know, just so they weren't showing that their lock was insecure. And it did cause a lot of controversy. And Alfred wasn't shy of controversy. What he later then went on to do was create a paper which detailed the locks of that time, how to uh, break them and the vulnerabilities, and not just locks, he also did safes. Now, this is a quote from Alfred. Rogues are very keen in their profession and know already much more than we can teach them. So basically, he's saying, the bad guys know about this stuff, so let's let the public know about it then they can better protect themselves. So hence, his paper's being released. And this caused all sorts of dramas for him, but he, he did a good thing. So there are different types of disclosure. Now, Alfred was into full disclosure. We have some others. We have non-disclosure, which is pretty much keep your mouth shut. Uh, you roll up, you could be working for a penetration testing firm, you're looking at a vendor's product, you sign your agreement, you're not going to talk about it to anyone. Also falls under this category are the kind of agreements that are made around zero days and when they get sold. And sometimes people just keep them to themselves. They, they just don't release them as well. But essentially, keep your mouth shut, don't talk about it, otherwise you're going to find you get lawyers on the back. Next up, my favourite, coordinated disclosure. And some people call it responsible disclosure, and Microsoft kind of coined the term coordinated and moved it more towards that. And some researchers agree, because basically sometimes there is nothing responsible about disclosure at all. And if you have to drop it online or something, maybe that could be seen as irresponsible. So coordinated shows the right kind of message, as in, 
I'm going to work with the vendor, the vendor's going to work with me, we're going to release this together. And then over a period of time, the fix will be applied, and then you'll be able to talk about it publicly. However, it is very much a waiting game. Now, these like lengths in time before it becomes public are various. You know, some people here one week, um, Google zero, 90 days. Um, I don't know if anyone saw on Twitter the other day with a guy about a Microsoft bug, and he dropped it on the 91st day because Microsoft were not patching it. And, and they weren't patching it, but they were patching it to a month later. So it caused a bit of controversy in the industry. We were like, well, you know, what's the point? You should have just held on a month and, you know, it was been fixed. But some of these reports, you know, can take as long as eight months, nine months. I've had stuff that's like nine months to a year. And if you don't want to wait, you can always do this. The full disclosure. And you get out there and you tell the public with the intention that you want to make sure that everyone knows so they can actually patch things and make themselves better protected. And this has been going on for some quite some time. You know, full disclosure and dropping it online and letting people know about it isn't just a thing because now we have Twitter. These guys, you know, nearly 20 years ago were having the same problems. Now this is Peter Zaiko, uh, who is part of the Cult of the Dead Cat. And there is a video here which I won't play, but basically it's him talking to the government. And he's saying, you know, the only way that he could get things fixed back then was to actually make it full disclosure and tell the public about it. Because then, funny enough, they actually patched it. <coughs> so, for us security researchers, it is a bit of a grey land. There's some things we want to let people know about, and there's some things we really don't. And there's also laws and legalizations to think about. <coughs> we have safe harbors with bug bounty programs, which is fantastic. <coughs> but what do you do if you're inside a bug bounty program and the terms of service completely contradict what the bug bounty program says? And Amit el she actually found that out. She looked through and she found ones that actually contradicted each other. What we need as security researchers is safe harbors, clear understanding, <coughs> decent terms of service. Sorry, I'm going to get a drink. <coughs> I was worried that this was going to happen. Haven't been smoking at all. <coughs> right. So we have the laws, and then we have the guidance. And these are some really good people who are actually helping. So we have Chloe, we also have Karen, and also Mip. What we also have is a thin line. And it's a thin line and it's a moral one. And it's one that we face on a daily basis. And I love this word, anonymy, which is a condition in which society provides a little moral guidance to individuals. And we need that, we need that kind of like peer help from others to help us know what the right and wrong thing is to do. So we have bug bounty programs, <coughs> and their intention is to actually give us guidance. However, bug bounty programs can lead to, I'd say, a level of expectation where you actually expect money in return. And this is a part with um, Uber. So, Uber has a really, really good bug bounty program. <coughs> and some guys found out that they had... 15 million users that details and with that what they did is they turned around to Uber and they said well yeah okay ten thousand dollars we want a hundred thousand or whatever it was <coughs> the problem is 
who became thin. They gave them the money, which then sent all the wrong signals because the same guys then went out and did it to another company. They then later got arrested for doing that. So there is a very thin line. <coughs> so what do we have? We have international standards. But these these are like for companies and the vendors, they're not for our security researchers, but I would say go and download them if you get a chance, go and have a look. They are quite pricey though. And they give you an idea of how to handle a vulnerability management program. So if your company doesn't have one, check it out. It gives you a really good idea of what to do. But half the time it's actually understanding what to do. <coughs> so some really good talks um, from Katie and also Mir. And they go through, uh, this is one of the diagrams from the ISO. And they go through the process and talk about it. It's really good. Because some of this stuff can be difficult to understand. <coughs> so, can anyone notice the similarities here? At all? Squares. squares. Yeah, we've got squares, we've got circles, we've got arrows. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same thing, just yeah, right. the user is called the deployer of the view. <laughs> There's no arrow left to define it. Spot on! But to buy you a fear later. Yes. <laughs> that is it. So basically, if we look at the binder here and here, it's all away. And we're giving this to vendors and people that want to have vulnerability management programs. And what we're doing, we're sending a visual wrong message. So, sir, they're pretty good. I spoke to the guys. Now, with ISO standards, <coughs> the problem we have is a lot of bureaucracy trying to get things changed. The guy who helps run the uh, stuff over in America, Alan, absolutely lovely guy, he had a conversation with me and I said to him, look, Alan, the finders in diagrams, the arrows are pointing all one way. And this is something that Saskia originally picked up and she's done a talk in this area also. And he was like, really? Okay, no problem, I'll get it fixed. The next edition is going to get it fixed. So the, the communication, the visual is going to change. So I'd say definitely I support these guys 100 percent A lot of the researchers I know have read these documents and this one specifically, and it actually feels like it's written for us researchers once which is good. Um, it's more of a guide and a report rather than a standard, but it might be something you want to include as a link when you're going through um, vulnerability disclosure with a party that doesn't have a vulnerability management progress in place because it covers everything. Okay, so the second part of my talk, <laughs> like I said, I have the bugs and the vulnerabilities also. Um, I have to show you some bits. Um, first off, is going to be whois.com. So, Nominet. Uh, Nominet, they deal with all the domain registrations and all the um, listed information. Now, <laughs> post GDPR, they then said, we don't want you to have all of the registered data we know it. So, any of you guys do OSIN work or check? Online, so we'll we'll check check on the link. Yeah. yeah. You'll see notice now for some of the majority of the domain names, when you go and have a look, it, you'll see a very limited data, everything's all redacted out. So they said, no, anyone who's who's asked, you know, it's gonna be called thin data. So you have thin data and that's basically um, dates when it was registered. <coughs> all redacted data, but it's there. And you have thick data, which is all the registering contact details, what you used to be able to see before uh, who is privacy part was played on top. Okay. ICANN. Now, ICANN is the American guys, and they are very much in the thick data game. So much so, they wanted to take a Germany company uh, to court three times, it lost. 
So it made them kind of like collect all this data because they said like, look, journalists say, look, post GDPR, why are we even collecting this data? Because it shouldn't be shown anyway. And that's part of the problem I need to speak to you about today. So, who is the problem? Who is, when you do a little who is search, you type in the search bar there, and what happens is you have a web page, and part of that web page invokes a, um, a script, and that is called request PHP. So the information goes across to the server, it looks at the database, and then the database is updated. Now, since GDPR, what they've been doing is they've actually been removing and redacting the data as that database is updated. So, put in abc.co.uk, the web page gets called for, it goes to the database, the database then returns a page, but with all the content, all the content and all the contact details redacted. That gets sent back the spin data to little Gary here. What I figured out is I could mess with this and write an exploit for it. So, it was completely by like chance actually when I did it. But what I figured out was um, I could stop requests, stop PHP going through, send everything else through, the database was never updated. It would then send back all of the thick data, all the contact details, everything for every single domain that was supposed to be hidden post GDPR. And fine, fair enough, all this data was available before for people who didn't have who is privacy pre-GDPR, but as we saw quite clearly, Nominet has said to every domain register company and everyone else, do not be given out that data. And everyone for who is did that. So did the little request, did all that, brilliant. Okay, I thought, right, I'd best tell them about it. It was my first ever bug, and it was really good. I raised the original issue with them in July 2018, and I was completely clueless. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know who to go to or what to do, so I tried contacting who is. I spoke to those guys. I had nothing. Um, it was very much, oh, you can tell us the details of everything over a chat box in the plane, and I'm like, no, that's not happening. <laughs> um, <coughs> so then I went through a disclosure assistance program, which was pretty cool. For me, at the time, I needed a little bit of extra help and understanding and someone to help guide me. Um, here is a video of the actual uh, of the script working. See if it works. Come on, this always happens to me all the time. <laughs> Every time. It doesn't matter. It's fine. Oh, yay. Yay. Okay. Um, like, so I know you might not be able to see this at the back, but basically this is me going once, one, twice, third time lucky, like, just pulling all the registered data via my little Python script that I wrote. <coughs> I actually wrote a, a script to try and protect the domains because I figured out I could write a script to actually go through all the different domains and make sure that this database was updated because if it wasn't updated, that domain then was a sitting duck for somebody else to go ahead and scrape the data. So if you go on to whois.com, you put your domain in the search box, and then if you pay attention up here, there'll be a little uh, circle and it'll be like updated. And I knew when I had uh, like a, a live target and I had all the information when it said like updated, I think with, it, with this one was like 342 days ago. What it should show is updated today or updated now. See, 342 days ago, I've got all the registered contact details. And then as soon as I let the request go through, um, I'm going to call it again. Just make sure I've definitely got the details and it's been exported to a CSV. Let the request go through and... It changes to update one second ago and it all disappears. So that's what you should be seeing. That the script is bypassing it. Okay, cool. And just to double check, it's now showing me the redacted data. Okay, cool. Right. Come 
My ticket got put into a category of tickets that gets put into a bucket that every time that I send a, a message through to or anyone else, there is no notification to the Hack One team. Which is bad. Because I essentially was streaming into the motherfucking void. Um, I spoke to who is, finally found out about like the, the communication channels that there were. They claimed it was not an issue at all, whatsoever. And proceeded to then uh, fix it practically the next day that they were told about it. And there's been an awful lot of backwards and forwards and be complaining and saying about the whole process. But the good thing is, you know, a disclosure assistance program is there to help people who have to deal with companies without a vulnerability management program. I would say I would definitely recommend going through it. Um, Hacker One have now improved their processes and done a complete recall of everything, which is fantastic. Um, obviously, things like this do happen, but for any researcher who does find themselves banging their heads to the table, you are not alone. This does happen. You just have to learn and have a bit of patience, unfortunately. So, yeah, it's, it's unacceptable, but you know, it happens. Next one. Okay, the bad. So the bad is when you don't think it's worth another second of your time. The bad for me was Microsoft Office 365. So within an Office 365 subscription, do you guys all know about Office 365? Do you use this stuff at work? You're going to have fun. Okay. So <laughs> there are different types of accounts. You have admin, you have a subscribed user account. So a subscribed user account would be someone who's got like the office business, the premium, E5, that sort of thing. You then have a shared mailbox and then you have a license. So that's someone with no subscriptions whatsoever. You have your online versions of things and you also have your desktop versions of things of Word, Excel, PowerPoint, SharePoint. And SharePoint and well, Microsoft have got a really good business model. You know, they're growing 3 million users per month. You know, they're, they're, they're making serious cash on this. And they're doing that because they're selling not only the packages, but they're selling little things like bulk songs as well. So SharePoint, pay attention to that. SharePoint is a chargeable service for all different accounts that you have. So how many of those accounts do you think you get SharePoint for free? All of them. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you've got a paid account, it doesn't matter if you've got a shared account, it doesn't matter if you've got a shared mailbox, or even unlicensed. <coughs> you can log in to SharePoint and you can see all the data of the tenant that they have made permissible for that organization. And that's a big problem. Because as this admins have their subscription-based model, thinking that people have rights to be able to see SharePoint, and they're the only people who are going to see SharePoint and the data online, when in fact it's not true. You have different accounts such as shared mailboxes that can actually log into Office 365 and use SharePoint and fly under the radar. Okay, shared mailboxes, interesting. We'll come back to that later. So this is Gary, Gary's a sysadmin, and this is Kevin, he's a really happy hacker with lots of cool stickers and stuff, <laughs> but he has very bad intentions. Now Gary's done a brilliant job because he's put two-factor authentication across the whole tenant for all of his users, and that's fantastic work, well done Gary. However, what happens is, his like, tenant and the users, they want to adapt mobile phones and mobile office work, so Gary's now in a predicament because office... Um, Outlook on the phone doesn't always work. 
And what you need to do in order to have a shared mailbox account on a mobile phone is generate a password for that person or that account. It's a shared mailbox user. So there'll be a password so you can log in. And that's how you do it. A lot of people don't know that you can actually do this for a shared mailbox, but you can. And you have your password there and you set it and then Gary can give that to a user and then they can put that in their phone along with the email like adding any other normal user account. So more than one person would have that. Can anyone see a problem with the passwords? Mm -hmm. So basically, when you go into Office 365, you generate a password. Um, and you can do auto generate or you can put your own. Now, you know, if the office has had means might be short on time, they might go ahead and do generate password. Now the problem is Microsoft generate their passwords with capital letter followed by two letters followed by five numbers. And I've checked this out. So this makes uh, 14 gigabytes worth of possible passwords in a list. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, because I'm going to have a little look at it myself, um, you can get it from my uh, GitHub. But if you use crunch, you can actually, that's the uh, command that you need to use to make your own uh, password list. Now what I would like to do, I'd like to take this password list and compare it to other dumps and cross-reference it to who's got tenants. Because then you might actually get an email address associated to a tenant with one of these and you can guarantee that it's probably going to be able to get in. Uh, there's probably other stuff I can do as well, but it was just a small finding I found. Okay, so, I'll tell you what, for the sake of time, and I know it's really important here as well, um, basically what I was going to show you is logging in with the shared mailbox uh, address, or the one without an actual subscription, and what a hacker can do is once they're actually into your tenant, because of really crappy passwords or whatever, or there's no two-factor authentication on, they can actually get into your office environment and into SharePoint by just clicking on this one link, okay? And what happens then is that they're actually able to do an awful lot of stuff. Be it, they can view an actual trade data. And this could be done through information gathering, you know, seeing what sort of files you've got there. But what's even worse is that they can actually create sites. They can create groups. And this is because of the default security settings that Microsoft let anyone have. So they can go in, they can actually um, see all these different sites that they want to, they can duplicate them and then have them online. So being able to create a site gives you a folder structure, it also gives you a shared mailbox as well for that group. And then what's even more is that they can actually upgrade their account. So Microsoft had a bug in their system recently where even if the system administrator looked at the backend settings to look at upgrades and the, the button that turns that on and off, even if it showed us off, it could have still been on. So they would have been able to go into the account and upgrade their account from just a shared mailbox or an unlicensed account to then being able to have it as something like a, a Teams account, which even gives them more leverage, or having a flow. And Microsoft Flow is quite interesting because you can then take the data from one uh, site and pipe it to another. Uh, and this is fine, you know, but, you know, things like this shouldn't really be happening. And the problem here is, is that Microsoft do not tell anyone about it. There is no documents about it. I became a sysadmin, I was on a tenant, and I was like, what the hell? And then I asked them, I phoned them up about it, and they're like, oh, yeah, we do know about that, but people have to phone us up to turn this flag off. Well, but how are people supposed to know even about it when you're not even putting it out there that it's a thing? You know, it's inherently insecure that a shared mailbox account or an unlicensed account can get onto a tenant and then visit SharePoint and do whatever the hell they want. So, yeah, information gathering. So it's really good. They just put in the site, in the search bar, it shows up. But if you go to the classic search results page, it's even better because it actually shows you the site that you can then go ahead and clone. So you don't even need to visit the page. And there is, um, it does get detected in the auditing, but you have to make sure that the auditing is turned on because it isn't turned on by default. And this is what it looks like on Cloud App Security. If you can afford it and you can have it on, on an E5 package, the problem is 
page view SharePoint. That's that's my IP so I've linked it out, right? So I've actually clicked on the view. But all the search queries, that just comes up as Microsoft's IP. So if you're a system admin and you've got hundreds of thousands of users on there, you're not even going to know. Uh, it's very easy to go on the radar. Um, and this is the audit uh, log. So this is a really good part of it, but you have to turn it on for it to work. Because otherwise, it's just gonna, you're not going to have that function of auditing. Okay, so here's the uh, attacker being able to log in to SharePoint through the access of one link and they can now create a site or they can create a news post. And what can they do then? They can then embed malicious links directly in that site. So as soon as someone clicks on it and you say, hey, come and join my new site within an organisation, that's it, they're owned. You know, the phishing on this is, is extensive. It's ridiculous to be there. Like I said before, the data exfiltration, also upgrading yourself to a Teams account. And what happens next? Gary gets a sack because no one's told him about it. It's all going on underneath his nose. He hasn't got the right auditing on. And when he complains to Microsoft and his company, they're like, oh no, but Microsoft wouldn't do that. So, you know, this does have ramifications. I reported it to Microsoft. Um, a very extensive report with videos and screencasts and screenshots. And I was thanked and I said, you know, this is a big problem. This is actually a, an issue for us. Um, thank you very much. Give us your details. We'll put you in the Microsoft Hall of Fame. Uh, awesome. Okay, I'm getting somewhere, finally. Uh, as you can tell, I've got really bad luck. <laughs> so, uh, things slowly got started to go south. I was out at DeepSec Vienna, um, and basically I received an email from the Microsoft research team, and the guy said, I'm really sorry, but the SharePoint engineers are not going to fix it. They see it's a licensing issue. It's not a security problem whatsoever. And then I'm like, right, okay. The next day, actually, I was attending um, a Microsoft talk, which is quite interesting, and I had, I had a little word book there. That, like, big thanks to the Microsoft guys, because, you know, talk about it if you want, so I am, to get out there to make sure other, like, system admins know about this sort of stuff in Office 365. Um, and they were banging their heads off a table, and, you know, my, my heart goes out to the Microsoft research team how to deal with this stuff. But obviously, if you're a security researcher, sometimes big guys don't always get it right. You know, but you just have to persevere with it and keep going. Um, yeah, it, why was it a thing and why would they not change it? And why was it even there in the first place? Because they said it caused friction with the SharePoint adaption. So basically, because people weren't enabling licenses specifically for SharePoint, they just made it a free-for-all. So someone didn't have to click a button. Um, like I said, before it's documented, but it's not out there, um, and that's their, their reply for it. So what can you do about it? You can review your SharePoint default configuration settings, review the logs, please turn on auditing if you're an Office 365 sysadmin, or even got it for yourself, personally, I would say it's a very good thing to do. Um, delete all unused accounts because they are sitting targets, especially without two-factor authentication. And that's why two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication is really important to have on all accounts, including your shared mailbox accounts. Okay, you have to do a hacky thing and give someone a password so they can have it on their mobile phone to keep the director happy, but at least try and have some sort of extra protection there to help. Because otherwise you'll open yourselves up to this kind of issue. And complain to Microsoft. That'd be really good, because I'm getting sick of my own voice, just being the only one complaining. <laughs> so, um, the next one. Oh, we did. Um, I found a blind success in multiple areas uh, for a secure application that actually received angel funding for security, because it's a security app. But they had XSS everywhere, and basically what it was is you had a website, and you would embed a web, like a widget within your website, someone can send a message through, that would then go to an admin panel, and what I found is I could just inject XSS, and then that would go through to the admin panel, as soon as the admin panel was opened up, they would then get attacked. So with this, I understood that they might not know about um, certain things, but I would have at least expected them to know about security. I sent them a video, I sent them a very good proof of concept where I showed an uh, XSS attack happening. I have a little AWS server with a keylogger on it, so it's very visual. People can see that the password's being stolen, and I duplicated their, their actual setup. Um, yeah, 
someone gets owned. And I found this through due diligence. So I look after a bunch of bodyguards, that's what I do. I'm like part sysadmin and this bug bounty stuff and everything else that I do in my, in my own time. Um, and as part of my due diligence, what I do for my own guys, is I make sure that the apps that we take on board are actually secure. So I found this through due diligence. Um, I asked for a very secure channel to pass it through to them, and they said, oh no, just use the system, it's fine. Um, they fell off. But I told them about bug, like, I told them about the bug and the issues, and I was very interested, not in their platform, but I thought it was a third party supplier issue. They were bringing in, um, a plugin or another app into the, their infrastructure, and they were really quite just, I don't know, seemed a little bit off from the start. So I was like, right, okay, <coughs> create my own NDA, just say to them, look, I'm a friendly hacker, I've got all this stuff, I'd love to tell you about it. Please, you know, it'd be nice if you can give me some money for doing this because you've got, like, you, you, you've got money, I haven't. And I've just spent a load of time writing reports for you because they asked for that. And um, I said to them, you know, I'm going to keep this confidential and once it's stop fix, then, you know, we talk about releasing it to public. And they said, yeah, sure, no problem. But the nature of any such agreement will be based on the sole discretion of the platform as it deems appropriate to the impact of the fixings of the findings on its key business objectives. I just found multiple point XSS in a secure application. I think that's going to have an impact on your business. So they said that they received the report and then they spoke to the web devs and the web devs were just a nightmare. They were just pleading ignorance. They said they actually had stuff on the back end to protect against this. Well, <laughs> so I was like, no, but you don't understand, it's XSF. And I just got really tired of like, talking to them in the end. Uh, it was not assessed as severe. The CEO asked about the extent of the vulnerability, and once again, did another report for the CEO so he can understand it even more. Um, obviously, I just wanted to just progress it and just get out of the way with it at this point. So, they offered me £75. Pound. Which is great, you know, something's better than nothing. <laughs> um, like, got loads more money than I have. Uh, they tried, to, the worst thing was, right, so as I said before, I was doing due diligence for my company, and they're like, yeah, we can give you £75, and we can give you, like, you know, a few months free, but we're going to turn you into a 12 month contract as part of that. That's really nice of them. Uh, their NDO was indefinite. I would never be able to speak about this to anyone, ever. So obviously I, I, I turned that down, <laughs> so no, it's all right. Um, they gave me a time limit, even though on their side it took them time to come back to me, I was given only like seven days and enjoyed that time I was away. Unfortunately, I was running late, I didn't get back on time, so I didn't report, I didn't like end up uh, doing it in the timeline. Okay, so the good, and there is good out there, there are good vulnerabilities, and I'll try and move through this as quickly as possible, so I'm Relatively hot, I don't know about you. The blue ink file upload vulnerability. So this was something that Larry Cashfollow was working on, and I know some other researchers have found it previously. And it was one of these things that was on YouTube, a load of skiddies that had it on there for years, and the security community were like, oh my god, you can do this? And they're like, yeah, it's been on YouTube for years. Um, but Larry, I'm working with him was a really great experience. Um, it's how I found Detectify. I came across a lot of things and I wanted to upload it to a platform. And because of the way that they work, you upload something, that you tell them about something like this, and then every single website that's affected, it would get a hit on. Um, and that's kind of handy if you've got 20,000 websites that this could probably be hit with. Um, the I saw the post about it, I reached out, I did my own research on it, and. Even though um, I didn't get any mounties for this, by the way, overall, this is one of my favorite projects I've worked on because of the communication and the working with the different researchers and the guys at Akamai. So, yeah, fluent file upload vulnerability, the ability to upload any file type due to lack of checks. Um, you also had issues with the um, Apache side of things. And the problem is, what I'd like to point out here, is even if you have your, your code secure and everything brilliantly working, you need to make sure that you're update, updating it and maintaining it, and there are sometimes things that are outside of your control that will happen. Um, 
So I managed to work with uh, CDNJS on this. So we were trying to cut the head of the snake off at the top when it came to the JavaScript implementation elements of this. There wasn't that much to do with it, so we didn't go ahead. But it was just an idea for any other researchers. If you do find vulnerabilities in Java, uh, JavaScript, it might be worth reaching out to these guys to see if they can do like a redirect. So instead of going to uh, an include where you've got a very vulnerable link that's um, requested, get all those links diverted to the latest version. So then the website will be updated with the latest version, not the vulnerable one. Um, it was just an idea that we were working on together, but it was interesting that they were really up for it. Um, and that was a really good one as well. Next one, unnamed call for paper platform which is actually within InfoSec. Um, once again, XSS, um, and you can attack anyone and see anyone's like, information to a degree because of this. Important thing here, the reviewing committee who would have opened up these profiles that were affected with XSS were really important people within the InfoSec community. Now, if you wanted to form someone within the information security community, this is your way in. Um, I did two reports with full diagrams and videos. I stayed up to like 4 a.m. to make sure that this was getting sent over to them straight away. Now, these guys dealt with this brilliantly, and I wish there were more organizations that dealt with it in such a way. Um, it was unfortunate for them because the application developers had turned the feature on, and it was actually a really bad feature for them, and that then led to the insecurity. Um, they acted on the reports immediately. So on the Friday, I reported it. By the Monday, it had been fixed. And it was the communication that we got, the back and forward. Because a lot of the time, you're reporting stuff to vendors and you just get ghosted. It's like being on fucking Tinder. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> what I'm saying is, like, if you have a vulnerability management program or your parts place, it'll improve that communication. <laughs> So they put QA in, pro, in, pro, like in place, it won't happen again. They were very uh, grateful and appreciated the time taken to produce, and we got a $250 reward. So that was my final buck. And that's how I felt when I did it. <laughs> <laughs> I saved all the people in InfoSec and I got money. That was great. Um, awesome people, if you are getting into bug bounty and stuff and would like to find out more information, Andy's a really good guy. Uh, big fan of his work, his book. Uh, also some other people up there, so I've Stu, Ghosty, Beer Farmers, which I'm a part of, and the Mini Hats Club, we've got really good research, got community there, they're fantastic. I've also created a, a Blooming report, so like I said before, there's thousands and thousands of websites that are still out there that are still affected, I haven't got the time to report more, but what you can do, if you want to earn yourself some points, you can head on over to Open Bug Bounty and you can submit a report there. I've put a report which is all laid out for you. All you need to do is submit it or add to it as you see fit and find the websites that are vulnerable. That's on my blog, so you can go on there and start getting into this sort of thing if you want to. Um, final points, uh, know your rights when it comes to the terms of service. The, sorry, I had a really bad coffee for earlier and I couldn't go on to it as much as I'd like to. I've got asthma, by the way, so it's not great. Um, terms of service. Um, the ISO standards, uh, you know, learn. If you're going to get into this sort of stuff, think about it, learn the laws. And there are changes. I know there's a lot of stuff going on with IoT at the moment and everything else. These are the disclosure templates together. The one I got from Andy uh, Gill was brilliant. Work on explaining the frequent problems and then you can start to build a repository of all your different um, attack surfaces. Um, analogies and examples are always a good thing. Um, I've got an AWS server which has also got key login scripts on it as well, so you can show in one window the password being stolen when you've done like an actual vision page or like the login box, and that's pretty cool. People like visual. And speak to the researcher community because you never know when you might need their help. It gets incredibly stressful being a bug bounty or a security researcher because you can get periods of time where you don't find anything, which is fine, then you get periods of time where you do find things and then you get absolutely ignored and the stuff isn't always uh, appreciated. And what I try and do is, at the moment, the part of the church path is, is try and help the younger guys because I've got guys who are like 16, 17, 18, absolutely smashing it, really talented. They're finding vulnerabilities and things and they don't know what to do and they don't get taken seriously either. They go and report it and they get completely ignored. You go to somebody else in the industry, you might know somebody else, and you give them the support, 
then they're likely to have a successful outcome. And it stops them dropping it on Twitter. And it stops them from dropping it online because that's what we don't want. We don't want these young kids going into a, a mentality where they end up being black cats just due to frustration. No? So right, we're going to do it, do it by choice, but don't do it because frustration. Okay, final thoughts. Go and read that uh, report. It's really great. Even in the last page, we've got in an ideal world, you know, we do what you expect it to do. It doesn't, but, you know. Um, any questions? I know we're probably running on time. Questions? Yeah, go on. Um, part of the disclosure procedure is sometimes just to make a write up of stuff like that. And if you read carefully through those expensive ISO guidelines, there's not a single word about non disclosure in it. Yeah. Yeah. Non disclosure is not part of any guideline, yeah. but it's the practice of a lot of uh, platforms, Zero Copter, Bookrout, HackerOne, all they've got those private programs as well, and yeah. even in our own terms, you are uh, bound to a lot of, in, uh, well, limited uh, confidentiality agreements sure. and stuff like that. Yeah. So there's a big job for platforms, but also for companies to be right. more comfortable with this disclosure thing. That's From my own experience, it really helps if you make a big write-up, send up the draft, and ask for this responsible disclosure, if it's possible, it's a public program or whatever, yeah. and um, I think those private programs, it's, it's, it's uh, a big problem because you, you don't have any insurance as a researcher, you can send them your report and they add up in some drawer. Yeah, well, like my mom, mom was stuck in a bucket that had nothing, you know, no yeah. notifications, and then I was like, for months, what's going on, 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 what happened with a few of my reports was that it went to the communication department and they got stressed about mm -hmm. this guy somewhere in the Netherlands about to publish something and then things got, yeah, the world got turning and, and yeah. that helps. But it's also a difficult happens. thing because you need to do it without any emotion and stuff like that. Yeah. Being real. We do need, there's so much more room for improvement here, guys. You know, and if you're in the capacity to perhaps help at all, you know, look into this stuff. There are other people who are very much more well versed in the legalities of this doing it. Um, I'd say definitely try and get involved in this uh, disclosure.io. Um, they're making movements with providing researchers more um, help and assistance in this area and legal uh, frameworks to work with in. Because all of these bug bounty programs look great, but you know, what protections do we have as researchers? And I don't want to see any of my friends at least being arrested or being sued because they found something we're trying to do good. Um, so anyway, if there's no questions, let's get out of here because it's really hot. I knew you had an asthma attack earlier. <laughs> so yeah, and a load of us are probably going to go out often. If anyone wants to go to the torture museum by any chance, let me know. <laughs> 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 okay, no worries. Thank you.